The following production is sponsored by the National Science Foundation's Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation Program. In this video, we will examine the individual and combined effects of shear and torsional loading on small-scale bridge piers. Five specimens were tested experimentally at the University of Illinois. Fabrication methods, testing procedures, and results are presented. Shear stress is a stress which is applied along the surface of a material. When applied to a square, it causes it to take on the shape of a rhombus. Shear is applied by moving the top of the specimen laterally while restraining rotation. The effect of this deformation creates tensile stresses that tend to crack concrete, which is much weaker in tension than in compression. Shear stresses act along a line that is inclined at approximately 45 degrees. These stresses are symmetric about the cross-section, acting in the same direction on opposite sides of the member. Shear forces in building columns and bridge piers occur as a result of wind, seismic, and impact loads. The response of reinforced concrete to shear forces is important, as it can control the strength and deformation capacity of many buildings and bridges. Typical shear failure consists of 45-degree inclined cracks opening up and rapidly propagating through the cross-section. This failure is commonly seen in field studies following a significant earthquake. The test specimens are 1 20th scale bridge piers with designs based on Federal Highway Administration examples. In addition to scaling down dimensions and reinforcement sizes, special consideration is made in designing a micro-concrete mix containing appropriately scaled and graded aggregate proportioned with water and Type 3 cement. The piers were cast using formwork constructed of PVC and plywood, which were fitted with longitudinal reinforcement to provide flexural strength to resist bending actions and spiral reinforcement to provide shear and torsion capacity. After allowing the microconcrete to cure for three weeks, the formwork was removed and the specimens were painted and fitted with steel end plates to facilitate connection to the testing apparatus. The Illinois testing facility used to conduct these tests is part of the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation Program of the National Science Foundation. It includes a small-scale strong wall with loading units that can impose loads in six degrees of freedom, any combination of three translations and three rotations on the test structure. A single loading unit is used in this test to control the shear and torsion applied to the small-scale specimens. Linear potentiometers were used to verify the measurements from the loading unit. Three cameras were placed in strategic positions to capture the behavior of the specimen, one directly in front of the specimen, one to the rear left of the specimen, and one to the rear right of the specimen. In this test, the pier was subjected only to lateral displacement to induce shear stress. The applied displacements and resulting forces can be seen in the graphs on the right, along with a stop-motion video of the experiment from the three angles captured by the cameras. The bar below the center video displays the increasing levels of displacement applied to the pier as the test progresses. The plot in the upper right corner is called a hysteretic response curve and is a plot of the force generated in the pier due to the applied displacements. Note that in this test, there is no applied rotation, as shown by the stationary point on the circle in the bottom left corner, and no response shown in the bottom right plot. Now, as we view the video, notice how the response increases linearly at first, indicating no permanent damage to the pier. Eventually, small diagonal cracks form on the front face toward the top of the specimen. The cracks open and close based on the direction of the displacement. Cracking is accompanied by a softening of the structure as seen in the loss of linear behavior. Eventually, the reinforcing steel begins to yield, which is shown in the reduced stiffness of the plot, and finally in the reduction of force values with increasing applied displacements. This is followed by shear failure of the concrete. This permanent damage is accompanied by a loss of strength and is evident in the large cracks which develop through the specimen. The specimen is then taken through a cycle of increased displacement while maintaining a small amount of force resistance to further assess the post-peak behavior of the pier, which includes strength loss and ultimate displacements. 
The relationship between various levels of applied lateral and torsional loading can be seen in a comparison of the plots of the critical points defined for each test. It is clearly shown that any addition of lateral loading will reduce the torsional capacity of the pier, while a more significant level of torsional loading is necessary to reduce the lateral capacity. Failure of each specimen was determined by noting the point at which the load carrying capacity of the specimen dropped significantly. All five specimens are shown here at the point of failure, with the maximum lateral and torsional loads reached in testing noted below each image. Notice the differences between the shear dominated failure and the torsion dominated failure. In the cases exhibiting shear dominated failure, parallel diagonal cracking occurred on the front and back face whereas the cracking in the torsion dominated failure progressed in a radial fashion at the same angle around the specimen. Note that for the 1 to 3 shear to torsion test, the shear and torsional stresses appear to be balanced on the front face, resulting in diagonal cracking on the rear face only. Recall that the 3 to 1 shear to torsion test is performed with stresses additive on the front face, though the shear failure dominates in this case. This set of experimental small-scale tests is used to produce a plot of combined shear and torsion components exhibited by peers with the same properties. An envelope can be traced around this data to obtain a rough estimate of a shear-torsion interaction diagram. Data recorded after a sudden drop in shear or torsional strength is beyond the satisfactory region of structural performance and is therefore excluded. The outlying points of the remaining data are enclosed in one plot and neglected in another to produce an interaction diagram depicting ultimate limit states and one depicting more conservative limits that are safer to use in practice. It is evident that interaction effects will reduce the ultimate strength that can be achieved by the specimen. This agrees with the engineering principles previously discussed, in which the shear stress components are additive on one surface of the specimen, resulting in earlier shear failure. Therefore, a set of small-scale experiments has been used to illustrate the basic engineering principles of shear and torsion.